difficult to make them different so that people don't think, oh, it's like Mickey or yes. it's like the great mouse detective or, mm -hmm. you know, that, that has to be a, a challenge. Yeah, he has to be unique unto, him, uh, unto himself. He has to have his own particular personality, his own persona. And Fievel does have that. He's a rag, tattered, little tiny mouse, an immigrant mouse from Russia. I've never seen a mouse like that before. He represents some of the qualities that many of the immigrants coming over here in the early uh, or the turn of the century had. You know, the hope of finding a new and better life, a dream, so to speak. And he's brave, he's courageous, he's willful. He can be very sad, he can be very pathetic at times because he's lost his family in essence and he's spending the entire picture trying to find them. His little odyssey is, ba is much different from any other mouse that you've seen before. He has his own brand of spunk, his own brand of ingenuity, and he probably will remind a lot of children, a lot of kids of the audience of themselves and what they're all about. It might even remind parents about what they were like when they were young. So his little message that he brings to the screen will be different all the other mice characters that you've seen before. But what we mentioned earlier, uh, the great mouse detective, and uh, you're aware, I'm sure, that uh, the re-released animated features always do so much better at the box office than the new ones. Mm, yes. Now, how does this give people like you the courage to come out with a new one when you must feel that uh, there's a little bit of a risk there? Sometimes, yes, but uh, I don't know. There's a little bit of, of the explorer in us animators. We're always willing to try and take a risk at the medium because we all feel that, you know, with as much as there's been done in animation, only the surface has really been scratched. There's so much more new ground to break, new stories to tell, or new ways to tell it. And um, though the re-release pictures do come out, they do uh, receive a profit, they do very well, in that they have a history. Many of the films, the older films like a Pinocchio or Snow White, have enjoyed maybe six or seven re-releases in their lifetime. And it's because the people who originally saw them love them and they will see them again and they'll take their children to see them and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren if they live on because the message of those films transcends time their universal appeal and their plot line goes right for the heart and those types of stories can be told in many different forms and they haven't all been told yet American Tale is just another one hopefully it will make its contribution to if there's ever an animation hall of fame, maybe it'll, <laughs> maybe it'll be a candidate. This one has so much appeal, of, uh, naturally, for children, but it's something that grown-ups can sit through yes. without squirming and just, you know, looking at their watches every five minutes. Yes. Was that a conscious thing on your part? Absolutely. We didn't want to make a babysitter. We didn't want to make the film that the adults can drop their kids off and hope that they're entertained or at least watched over for an hour, an hour and a half and then pick them up later. It's something for the family, for the whole family. It's a family picture. It's about a family and their problems. Some of the entertainment value is not for children. It's primarily for adults. It may even go over the children's head, but it'll entertain the family, the adults as well as the children. And that was a conscious effort. It was hard to make sure that all of these ideas and uh, different levels of appeal are woven together nicely into a story to make one nice visual tapestry. But it was important to create a film that can be enjoyed by all rather than just one small group. Did I miss something, John, or uh, does the baby just disappear? What happened? <laughs> what, happened to, what happened to the baby? <laughs> <laughs> I think the baby did disappear. We had a couple of scenes that were cut out at the last moment of, of uh, Yasha, I think the baby's name is. And keeping track of those little details is always hard to do. You'll have a scene where suddenly, where's the baby? So we had to make sure that the baby was included in there in a couple of scenes. We had to go back in, invest more time and money to make sure it was redrawn into the scene. 
but towards the end of the picture, I'm afraid the baby got up and walked out. <laughs> Baby went back to Russia? <laughs> could be, could be. Maybe maybe the baby will be in the sequel. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> the case of the missing baby. Yes. <laughs> okay. One last question is, uh, there's so much talk now among young people, student animators, who tend to think that the whole future is in computer animation. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the future of computer animation? Well, the future will be as an aid. It'll never be able to replace the human mind or the soul. It can't generate those ideas as a human will do. It'll be exploited as a device to augment uh, the artistic and technical aspects of getting a production finished. While I'm animating, I'm creating the illusion of life. I will maybe do three drawings that'll express that emotion. But there is all of the technical humdrum that goes in doing just what we call the in-betweens, which are the mechanical, transitional drawings between one pose and the next. A computer can do that, but it cannot invent the thought process. That has to be done by a human brain. And the whole time you were talking, I was thinking about Tron, saying, yep, yep. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> That's what happened to Tron. Mm -hmm. Well, John, thanks for your time. Enjoyed it very much. Yeah. And I do hope the film does well. Um, we'll do our best to get the word out. Thank you, Bobby. Okay. What are you trying to say with yeah. your hour and a half? What is it all about? Uh, yeah. Yeah. But there must have been a feeling, I think, back then that would that somehow, I don't know how you would duplicate it because they had just come out of a depression and there was this camaraderie that mm. the nation was feeling. Everyone had to be arm in arm in order to survive another day in a soup mm. line. Mm -hmm. And so those type of films, they just clicked home. Mm -hmm. And there was a conscious effort to make those little par parables on film. Mm -hmm. You know, as well mm -hmm. as the Busby Berkeley dance numbers yeah. as the escape, you know, <laughs> for an escape during the day, you know. Yeah. But the nice blend of a yeah. good story and fantasy, yeah. oh, that's what needs to be exploited. There's been a lot of good attempts at that, like the Star Wars trilogy, yes. Lucas. And I've always thought that that was Stephen's strong point. I said, here's mm -hmm. a man who knows how to tell a story. And that, uh, uh, for me, he's kind of a benchmark as, as far as a storyteller and other people who try to emulate mm -hmm. what he does and fail, it's generally, in my opinion, because they haven't told the story or they haven't told it well. Yeah. And Stephen is a storyteller. Yeah, oh yeah. He loves, right now, he loves playing the part of a, well, this is what Walt Disney do, did well. This is what people like Irving Thalberg did at the MGM Studios. They are the little honeybee. They travel from one mm. flower to another pollinating, and they spread their genius over many different people. Sometimes it may not work because of the chemistry, but many times it does. Yeah. And in this particular production, he was a catalyst and got things going for us yeah. and maybe even for the industry. Yeah. Because I can't emphasize that enough that the animation industry is really down on its back, mm -hmm. fighting mm -hmm. badly. I mean, how many films have you seen now that have been basically an hour and a half advertising window for bears mm -hmm. or for puddings mm -hmm. or for candy mm -hmm. or for some product? Or the story, what story? We're selling candy yes. for God's yes. sakes. Yeah. You know, come on. This is the commercial. We're selling cupcakes. Yeah. You know, we're not making art. Yeah. <laughs> What is it about mice that's so attractive to animators? Well... <laughs> okay, that's okay. fine. Did you want me to and answer that, no, it No, no, that's okay. fine. What you're doing okay. is just fine. Okay. Isn't it a challenge, though, to make your mouse different from other mice? Given the fact that new animated features have not done too well at the box office, wasn't that kind of risky for you people to come up with a new one? Okay. Um, isn't this the first time that Steven Spielberg has been associated with an animated feature? Right?
time. Do you think computer animation has a future? Okay. I'll phrase that another way too for okay, it's still rolling? All right. What do you think is the future of computer animation? Why are so many animated features about mice? <laughs> Wasn't it kind of risky doing a new animated feature because recent ones have not done well at the box office? What do you think is the future of computer animation? Okay. I, I think now we can just do some reactions. Okay. Yeah, some reactions. You can do some two and some single. Mm -hmm. If you want to, okay. okay. All Oh, he, he, okay, you talk about anything. We're not recording sound, so talk about anything. Tell me about how you will do uh, motions and uh, so that you can get the body movement in the animation. Well, Did you videotape your, yourself? Yes. Yeah. yeah, just tell me about that. Well, uh, what I do is I'll look at a storyboard and I will stage myself in basically the same staging that's on the storyboard for the character, the way that's laid out. And then I'll have someone film me mocking that character, the way he may walk or the may, way he may run or whatever, the way he leaps. And then I'll take that as a reference. And the way I've been able to do it in this picture is uh, we'll do it all in videotape and I can get a video readout on paper, little sheets of paper of each frame so I can analyze it. But the idea Bobby is not to use it as a crutch, only as an aid, because sometimes you can get carried away and you'll have like a, you know, something very stiff and inanimate. Mm. It'll look artificial. It won't have that squashiness, that believability, mm. or the cuddliness. That's very important. So usually using it as only a guide. Mm. I'll take another 20 seconds. <laughs> And of course, the end result is trying to get something that looks convincing. We animators are interested in what's called the willing suspension of disbelief. Yeah. <laughs> How about that one for a cliche? <laughs> but it, it has everything to do with you as the audience being totally involved with what you're seeing on the screen. You're projecting yourself up there. You become the character. And if if I can't become the character while I'm animating it with that sincerity, you won't become the character as you're watching it and participating in his or hers adventure on the screen. And it's that, that brand of attention.